Okay, welcome everyone. Um, this is another um, of the many events on uh, illicit financial flows and the politics of offshore that we've been running at the Martin School for the past year or so. The first such event already took place, I think, a year ago with uh, Dame Margaret uh, Hodge and um, Andrew Mitchell. And, and so it's wonderful to welcome you back uh, to another event which uh, sounds just, just as promising. Um, the international standards regarding money laundering and terrorist financing are set by the Paris-based Financial Action Task Force, which describes itself as a global watchdog whose recommendations aim to prevent these illegal activities and the harm they cause to society. Yet various scandals, such as just in recent years, the laundromats of Russia and Azerbaijan, where billions of dollars were laundered into the West and specifically through, through London in many of these cases, have led to questions as to how effective these standards are in relation to illicit financial flows, specifically from kleptocratic regimes, where ruling elite control, steal, and profit from their country's natural resources and lucrative business opportunities. Similarly, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has cast light on the billions of dollars of dubiously acquired funds stashed in London by the oligarchs and other financial supporters of Vladimir Putin. Can the Financial Action Task Force and other multilateral institutions be effective in generating the necessary political will when so many countries rely on illicit flows either to finance their economies or to stay in power? How could international efforts be made more effective? If the Financial Action Task Force is not the answer in curbing theft by corrupt regimes and their cronies, then what is? Does the solution lie in national legislation, international cooperation, or primarily in law enforcement? And what is the role of the UK in all of this? To discuss these matters, we have a wonderful pa panel of leading experts uh, from investigative journalism, from politics, from academia, and the anti-corruption world. Um, first, I'll introduce Dame Margaret Hodge, um, who has been MP from, for Barking and Dagenham since 1994. She has held a number of ministerial roles under the, last under the last Labour government and served as chair of the Public Accounts Committee from 2010 to 2015. Currently, she is chair of the all-party parliamentary group on anti-corruption and responsible tax and campaigns for a clampdown on illicit finance and dirty money. Jason Sharman is the Sir Patrick Sheehy Professor of International Relations at the Uni University of Cambridge and is the author of many books on money laundering, on corruption and tax havens. He has advised many international bodies, including, I believe, the Financial Action Task Force. Sue Hawley is the founder and executive director of Spotlight on Corruption and one of the UK's leading experts in this field. Her work has included taking the UK Expert Credits Guarantee Department to court for weakening anti-bribery procedures, challenging the decision to drop the investigation into the BAE Al Yamama scandal, a sh sh shameful decision, working to secure aid funding for international anti-corruption enforcement in the UK and being part of efforts to ensure that corporal liability was included in the Bribery Act. Finally, uh, to my right, Oliver Bullo is the award-winning author of such uh, notable books as Moneyland, Butler to the World, and several others, and is currently a fellow, a visiting fellow here with us at the Oxford Martin School. Welcome once again. I'm very much looking forward to this conversation. I should also say that in addition to the sizable audience uh, in the room, we have a very large additional audience online. Um, we, uh, when we come to the Q&A, we're going to obviously elicit questions from the physical audience here, but we're also going to count on the contribution from our on online audience. So thank you, thank you for watching us. Um, let me start uh, with Oliver here. Oliver, can you please tell us what purpose does the Financial Action Task Force serve? And is it effective in tackling the global ramifications of kleptocracy? Yes, <clears throat> thanks Ricardo, and, and really an honor to be on this panel. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, I'm, 
currently researching a book on anti-money laundering, the failure of anti-money laundering. And I'm going to try and compress my book into five minutes. Uh, now, <clears throat> this may be difficult. Um, there are many definitions of money laundering. Um, uh, I describe it as the support service for the world's worst people. Um, you do not uh, commit acquisitive crime if you cannot launder the proceeds. So inevitably, therefore, it is essentially uh, what makes fraud, kleptocracy, any form of tax evasion possible is money laundering. Um, it, is, it was estimated in the mid-1990s uh, that the volume of money being laundered through the global economy was 2 to 5% of GDP. The figure was a guess uh, at the time, but it's sort of generally continuously quoted to this day. Um, so what we're talking about is a really sizable sum of money, whether it's more, a little bit more or a little bit less than that, it's still a really huge amount of money. Um, and it began to really grow with the growth of complexity in the world economy from the 1960s. Uh, and uh, the first country to really take it seriously was the United States with this extraordinarily inaptly named Bank Secrecy Act of 1970. Um, which in fact did the opposite of imposed secrecy on banks. It forced them to actually keep record of their transactions and to report cash transactions over $10,000. Um, that was challenged by banks who didn't want to do it, but it really began to be enforced in 1980, which is when the world started to tackle money laundering uh, for real. Um, I've been speaking recently to one of the detectives involved in that effort. It was called Operation Greenback in Florida in 1980. Uh, and it is hilarious how crude money laundering was. He would describe seeing cars full of cash, turn up outside banks, call over a security guard, and they would just move boxes full of cash into the bank, and that would be all it was. But after they started to investigate and crack down, the process began that continues to this day of, of the adaptation of criminals to our response to them. Inevitably, criminals rapidly responded to the US law enforcement effort by moving their money to other countries. The Bahamas is only a 40-minute flight from Florida. All you had to do was fill a jet with cash and put it in the bank in the Bahamas, and you didn't have to worry about the FBI or the IRS anymore. So the FATF, it's a sort of rather inapt acronym, often called FATF, but it doesn't really work, um, uh, was created by the G7 in 1989. Uh, in the, uh, the, the meeting was hosted in Paris, but it was very much driven by the US, which was keen to gain international cooperation in the battle it had declared against money laundering. And it adopted a series of standards which it wished all its members to impose. And its members were essentially the, uh, not just the G7, but the, all the large industrialized wealthy countries all joined FATF and, and agreed to impose these sanctions on themselves. So its great strength was that it, it pulled together all the financial powerhouses of the world. And it was designed to sort of have this perfect combination of technocratic and political so that it, it, its standards would be accepted by everyone, but it would have the political clout to impose them. Um, its great weakness was that it brought together all the great political uh, and financial centers of the world. Um, and since it, was, it began uh, imposing its uh, standards um, towards the end of the 1990s, it's been really very good at imposing its standards on small, isolated countries, and incredibly bad at imposing its standards on itself. Um, among the uh, financial powers targeted by its first blacklist in 2000 was the Pacific island of Nui, uh, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, N-I-U-E, with a population of 4,000 and no actual banks. Um, it's hard to see how a country could money launder without any banks, but anyway, it was sanctioned and had to change its measures. So was the Marshall Islands, which came as a bit of a surprise to them, since its entire financial system had been created by the United States uh, with the funding of a grant from the United States. Um, recently, an um, official of the Central Bank in the Bahamas uh, produced a report attempting to analyze all of the reports issued by the FATF and its various regional offshoots since its creation and trying to explain the decisions that it had made entirely by racism. Um, he's not saying that they were motivated by racism, but if they were, that's exactly what they would look like. It targets small, small countries populated largely by people whose skin is darker than that found in Europe. Um, uh, and that is often when we talk about the fact that that's what we talk about. We talk about hypocrisy. We talk about um, the fact that it targets small island nations rather than the big onshore jurisdictions where money laundering actually occurs. Um, but we mustn't lose sight of reality in this argument. And the reality is that the FATF has failed completely. Um, you know, I mentioned that estimate at the beginning of 2 to 5% of global GDP being laundered. Um, people argue about how accurate it was when it was created, but no one argues that the total being laundered now is less than that. Um, after, 
whatever we're at now, um, 35 odd years of coordinated global efforts against money laundering, the estimate of the amount being laundered globally is exactly the same. Um, uh, why it's a failure is perhaps something we can discuss, but I don't think anyone would dispute that it is a failure and it is important to discuss what we should replace FATF with, uh, because I think um, we have to accept that it has, since 1989, failed to achieve anything at all, apart from victimizing small countries that frankly would have needed our help rather than our hindrance. Thank you. Uh, that's a very sort of final statement on, on <laughs> FATF. But could, be, before we get to the alternatives, which I, I suspect you're going to, to, to su suggest to us, uh, alternative enforcement regimes, uh, why do you think that uh, if, if the racism line doesn't work, why do you think that looking back there's a pattern whereby very small jurisdictions get targeted, get blacklisted by uh, the Financial Action Task Force. Very conspicuously, OECD member states don't. Um, some influential uh, places in, in Asia, I'm thinking Dubai, Singapore, Hong Kong, special region of Macau, also don't get a lot of pushback. More recently, gray listed, but they've never been uh, as targeted as one would expect them to be in view of their centrality for the practices you, you were thinking about. If not racism, then what? There is a, a political aspect to the choice of which countries get blacklisted. Um, although there is a technocratic analysis of the nature of both their anti-money laundering rules and the enforcement of those rules, uh, which is supposedly neutral, and in fact probably is neutral in how it is assessed by the FATF's experts, when you come to choosing which countries end up being blacklisted, this is a discussed in a general assembly. And countries that have a lot of friends, countries like, say, Japan, which um, I think everyone involved agrees probably should have been the very least graylisted, if not blacklisted, quite recently, um, they can persuade people to massage the, the marks slightly upwards. Um, the United States, uh, despite the fact that it has, um, you know, as I'm sure Professor Sharman can talk about, um, a hilariously badly run series of corporate registries manages to achieve excellent results uh, on effectiveness, which more than compensate for its poor results on the uh, rules that it has. Um, you know, the effectiveness rule um, can go a long way in making up for deficiencies in, in the legislation that countries have. Um, if you are, however, uh, the Marshall Islands, Nui, um, uh, Palau, then you do not have those kind of friends willing to, bait, to, to fight your corner in the General Assembly, and you end up being victimized. Um, you know, it is noticeable that in the first blacklist issued, Russia was blacklisted. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think that is a demonstration of, of the fact that Russia in those days had very few friends. Um, it then gained friends under Vladimir Putin with the war on terror, and it slipped off the blacklist, despite the fact that, um, as I think we can probably all agree, Russia has not ceased being um, one of the largest centers of uh, criminal activity in the world. So, you know, it is, a, it, it is a political statement getting blacklisted by the FATF, despite the fact that it's dressed up in a sort of technocratic um, clothing. So, Oliver, should we, is, is, is the Financial Action Task Force beyond reform? Should we replace it with something else? Do you expect other bodies such as the EU to take up this role? How do you see things evolving ideally? Uh, I mean, there is a lot of discussion, uh, both in the tax justice world and in the anti-money laundering world that the, that the role played by the FATF or the OECD in tax justice should be being played by the United Nations, um, that there, it should be something uh, done at a more globally uh, representative level. Of course, the challenge with that is that you need to be able to impose your will on the United States and the European Union, um, and that is something that the United States, that the United Nations quite obviously cannot do. Um, so I'm not claiming this is an easy nut mm -hmm. to crack. However, I, I, it is, I think, indisputable that if you look at where the largest volume of money is being laundered, you will find the largest volume of money being laundered in the largest financial centers, which are obviously Manhattan and the city of London. Um, so really solving money laundering is a question to a relatively small number of large onshore economies that can, if they want to, uh, solve the problem that they deal with. Um, we've had a lot of, I, I mean, I'm currently thinking a lot about the Marshall Islands because I'm planning to go there later this month. Uh, to look into their own experience of being, being blacklisted. Um, as I say, they were blacklisted by the FATF in, the, in 2000, even though all of the activities being conducted by the Marshall Islands on behalf of their tax haven clients were being conducted out of an office building in Reston, Virginia. Um, uh, so the, black, the, the, the 
uh, Marsh Lines was blacklisted for the activities of a private company based in the United yeah. States. Um, this is often the way uh, with all money laundering that, that, that say places like the Cayman Islands are being blacklisted for activities which are being overseen from London. Um, and, and, and that is really, I think, where the solution lies in far more political will in the major onshore economies. Um, and if they were to be serious about tackling the problem, then the problem would probably be solved. Um, that's what's been lacking, is genuine political will rather than a sort of rhetorical commitment to, to kicking the problem upstairs to um, a, 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 a G7 body headquartered in Paris. Thank you, Oliver. Sue, uh, I'm just going to ask you a question about these issues but from a slightly different perspective. When we discuss kleptocracy, until recently we mostly discussed kleptocrats. Um, increasingly the conversation, and certainly your work, is about those who enable kleptocrats in onshore financial centers and places like London. Um, how are we doing in the fight against those enablers? Is that working? Yes. And who are they? <laughs> and who? <laughs> um, so, I mean, I think it, we, we shouldn't pivot away completely from kleptocrats. I think it was a false dichotomy of going after the kleptocrats or the enablers. Um, I think there's a real sense of impunity, um, you know, on in relation to kleptocrats as well. I will come on to enablers, but I mean, just to give you a couple of examples, you know, in the UK at the moment, we have Diazani Alison Madweke, who was the former Nigerian oil minister, who is thought to have stolen $20 billion worth out of the Nigerian oil ministry. 20 billion, yeah. Uh, and uh, there's a real question, like, should she be extradited back to Nigeria? And, and a lot of Nigerian civil society colleagues that we talked to were like, no, just get her prosecuted there. Long story, still not prosecuted here either. But I think I just wanted to make the point, another, you know, classic example, Manuel Chang from Mozambique um, took bribes from a major US bank, completely crashed the Mozambican economy, led to you know, devastating poverty, and the US are just trying to get him extradited back to um, prosecute him there. So I think that angle, you know, is really important to tackle and, and shouldn't be forgotten. Um, and I think there are real questions about how you go after kleptocrats. Are you going after the assets? Or are you going to prosecute them? That, you know, really important questions. Um, just, um, I think the, the point is that you've got to do supply and demand. Mm. And this is where actually one of the more successful international um, groups is the OECD Working Group on Bribery, which is much, much more robust than FATF. Um, and you can't play, you can't game the system as much. Um, and the supply side, you know, we've got to tackle it. It's what, you know, the role we play as a magnet for this dirty money, our professional enablers. And just for those of you who aren't, um, I'm sure you all are, but you know, who's a professional enabler? Um, they, <laughs> the experts in the field <laughs> know well, but you know, it's any professional who legitimizes transactions uh, and money through their um, professional skills. So it can be lawyers, it can be antiquities dealers and art dealers, educational establishments, um, estate agents, uh, PR firms, Football clubs, uh, actually, it can actually be anyone, really, <laughs> um, who is handling dirty money and then essentially legitimizing it. Um, and I think it's important to, you know, also that we agree on what we mean by professional neighbor because there's a bit of a tendency in government sometimes to kind of make out that we're only really talking about the bad, act, the bad apples, you know, the rogue actors. But I think a lot of um, the people in this room who work on this know it's actually about a systemic um, that you might have bad apples who knowingly do this, but there are a lot of people who either turn a blind eye or who are just servicing a client who's turned up and want to make profit from it. Um, so I think, you know, generally speaking, there's a kind of sense that it's these other actors. The financial sector, you know, has kind of cleaned up its act a fair amount. Still, you know, debate about how much they have. But it's these other actors who are really kind of outside of, um, you know, proper regulation and lead tackling. And just to give you an example, no country is doing well on this. So uh, the FATF reviews may be rubbish, but um, if you take them... <laughs> you said it. <laughs> uh, you know, just nine out of 200 uh, countries in FATF were compliant with the recommendations to tackle 
of professional enablers and make them do proper due diligence on their customers. Um, just eight countries are compliant with having proper supervision for those um, non-financial professionals. But just to give you, to back up um, Oliver's point, those countries included the Cayman Islands um, and the UK. Um, and the Cayman Islands was then put on the grey list <laughs> of FATF. So there are real questions around FATF reviews. But um, anyway, how do we, are we doing very well? You know, no one's doing very well, but there are things we can do um, to, to get better at it. And one of them is this supervision, you know, and regulating uh, the right people um, and regulating them effectively. So in the UK, we've got 22 different uh, legal and accountancy supervisors, mainly professional bodies who also represent their members. And unsurprisingly, they're far more interested in taking their members aside and giving them a cosy chat, saying, don't do it again, than actually fining them. Um, I think we also have to look at what are the sectors, you know, the, the money laundering moves, you know, you bring one sector into the regulated sector and then it moves to another sector. You know, how do you tackle that? Um, and I think the EU are doing some really interesting work uh, in this field, bringing football clubs, um, foundations, uh, but this is the EU Parliament is proposing that they're included. But also we have to get better at regulating globally. Like, you know, as uh, I think we've all discussed uh, in pre other forums, you know, the professional enablers in the UK, the lawyers, the accountants, they're all also based in Dubai. Mish Kondorea is also in Hong Kong and, and Singapore. They've all got offices there. Are there ways that we could actually hold them to account in the UK for how they service clients in those jurisdictions? It's hard, but I think it, you know, it needs to be part of the discussion. And then finally, do we need to move beyond just talking about kleptocracy and talking about crony capitalism and high net worth individuals from um, highly corrupt jurisdictions? Thank you, sir. I think the Can point... I just add sure. that no one's accusing Michelin de of anything. <laughs> um, excellent, excellent people. Um, and, and I think we can all agree on that. <laughs> That's for the benefit of the... <laughs> since we're going to go on YouTube anyway, <laughs> shortly after the event. Thank you for saving my skin, <laughs> Oliver. Thank you, Oliver. <laughs> well, uh, not addressing any particular law firm, but uh, more generally, Sue's point about um, enabler activity by UK-based actors potentially arguably already migrating to other more permissive jurisdictions as they find the UK to be on the threshold of enhanced regulation. That, that's obviously, this. there's a flight issue here that may well occur. Thank you, Sue, for putting that on, on our horizon. It also makes the, the broader point that at some basic level, there has to be systemic regulation that transcends the national context. Um, but a, a question I have for you, do you, do you think that either the Financial Action Task Force or other uh, in multilateral efforts, are they the right context to address this? I'm thinking, for instance, the EU's attempt at putting forward enhanced due diligence. Is that the sort of uh, broader effort that you're thinking of? I mean, I think if the EU do go as far as the Parliament want, so, uh, you know, really key set professionals is legal professionals. Yeah. We know that in the US, they are not covered by any anti-money laundering um, obligations, although there are you know, valiant efforts to try and bring them in um, going on at the moment. Um, there's a kind of bit of a battle between the EU Parliament and the EU Commission at the moment about how far they bring legal advice and legal professionals into the new um, money laundering directives. But I think that, you know, maybe it's for Oliver's new body when, mm -hmm. when he sets it up in <laughs> chairs here. But uh, we, we have to have global standards, you know, and, uh, and I think that's why we also have to, you know, in, we, we can worry about money being displaced to other jurisdictions, but we, we're still doing the right thing by having high standards because it will raise standards and keep a high bar on the agenda for other jurisdictions. So before I move to Jason, I have a question, which I could uh, arguably ask any of the panelists, but I'm, I'm bringing you back a bit to the UK context. There is a, a general perception, perhaps erroneous, perhaps not, that most of the enhanced effort of the last year and a half is fundamentally targeted at Russian high net worth individuals, but it is less than a systemic cleanup of the realities that in different ways you're all portraying. 
Is this accurate and why is that the case? Um, the, the bottom line, I'd be interested in what other people <laughs> on Me the too. panel say, is um, the ultimately this is about political will. And the UK, it, you know, is in a position where post-Brexit, it wants as much investment as it can get, get and it could, wants to open as many our, um, export markets as it can to its business. So we're not in a supremely strong uh, position here. Uh, but, you know, what's interesting is that, you know, with Russia, uh, it has been the catalyst uh, for a reckoning and, and actually putting in place a lot of uh, things that actually civil society, the private sector, the law enforcement have been asking for for, for for years. So, but whether they will then be used against other kleptocracies, uh, I think is still very, very much um, in the balance. Thank you. Margaret? Uh, I mean, I was just gonna come in because I think one of the problems, one of the systemic problems is that um, we as a country face two ways too often on these issues. So. Uh, we, we, can I take Kazakhstan as, a, as an example, where there's been a lot of work done in academia around the um, corruption, 150 people own more than 50% of the country's wealth, a lot of it has found its way here to the UK. Um, and I'll just share with you a story which illustrates it is that um, on the back of academic research, I, I had a, a German debate in the house in which I asked the Foreign Office to uh, sanction 30 people who were individuals who were particularly um, guilty of, uh, of uh, money laundering and bringing their money into the UK. After, I am obviously protected by parliamentary privilege in doing that. After the debate, I got a, a letter from one of the people I'd named telling, him, telling me I fantastically defamed him. Uh, and uh, I do what anybody sensible does, is just I got my office to write back and say, we've received nothing else. He wrote again, so we again wrote back and said, we've received. I then, uh, appallingly, get a, uh, an email from the desk, the Kazakh desk at the Foreign Office saying, why haven't you replied to this guy? Uh, and I thought, what on earth are these people doing? Why are they interested? Uh, so I again got my office to write back, not me, saying, why are you interested? And uh, Kazakh... And, and they wrote back saying, we're trying to maintain, it was on the, uh, apparently, apparently, on the uh, uh, advice of the um, uh, our, our, um, embassy in Kazakhstan, they wanted to maintain good relations and they didn't want me to name somebody who was a kleptocrat and who had brought a lot of money uh, around the world and here. And I, I think it's a good example of how we face too often both ways on issues. Uh, and it just so happens that at the moment Russia is the big enemy. So people are willing to tackle that, but that too could change. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that, Martin. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the, the, an extraordinary demonstration of how Britain has got essentially two foreign policies. There's one foreign policy run out of the FCDO, which is terribly in favour of democracy and doing the right thing, and another foreign policy being run out of the Treasury, which is more in favour of earning money from people who aren't necessarily Democrats and and through for too long um, the the earning money side has rather been prioritized over the doing the right thing side um, uh, you know sanctions I'm it's great I'm happy that, that lots of people have been sanctioned but but sanctions should be the, the the final piece of a jigsaw they shouldn't be the jigsaw you know what we need is a robust law enforcement response and then if something slips through the net you sanction it you shouldn't just wait and allow things to come through undeterred and then 20 years later sanction them it seems um, it seems that this should be a learning moment for us as a country to rebuild or build our law enforcement apparatus against financial crime, whereas it just seems to have relied on freezing lots of things and then hoping that maybe something will work out. Um, you know, hope isn't a strategy, and we need to have a proper one. Thank you, Oliver. Jason, would you like to address that question, or can I go straight to... Which I can go straight. So, Jason, what, what can we practically do, not just in the UK, but also at, at the multilateral level, um, that we can counter this, this type of, of financial crime that we're addressing here today? I mean, I, I think building on what previous speakers have said, I mean, first off, I start off with the same presumption that other speakers, that the system is not working uh, well. I think no one really knows the true figure of how much money is laundered. Uh, my favorite figure is a squillion dollars. And people say, what do you mean a squillion? That's a made up number. 
And my response is, yeah, well, all the other numbers are made up too. <laughs> but a squillion at least is obviously made up, whereas someone says 2 to 5% of GDP, you might mistakenly think there's some evidence behind it. But I think, I mean, even the FATF, uh, in a, actually a very useful report published in April last year, uh, said the thing that's changed over the last 30 years in anti-money laundering uh, is we have a lot more rules, but not a lot more effectiveness. So again, very much in line um, with what other people have said. So I think there is this common presumption, uh, even though we don't have conclusive evidence, even though we don't know the numbers, um, all the evidence that we do have suggests that the system is not working well. And I have, I think, two a controversial and a more controversial solution for those. And the first one that seems kind of obvious to me, except to consider, but other people get really offended when I mention this, is give up. <laughs> Anti-money laundering. We've given it a good go for 35 years. It's really expensive. It hasn't worked. Why don't we just say, looked like it was worth a try at the time, but it hasn't really worked. Money laundering is not only ineffective, anti-money laundering, it's actually really expensive too. Um, so it seems to create lots of inconvenience for everyone but money launderers. Uh, and that includes consumers of financial services in rich countries, but even more so in poor countries. Creates problems for charities, creates problems for remittance to developing countries. So at least, you know, if you say, well, how's anti-money laundering people doing? And people say, oh, it's expensive and it doesn't work. And then if you say, should we keep on doing it? And they say, yes. And I think, why? Um, I think at least there should be some thought given to that. But when I say that, people say that's an idea so stupid that only an academic could come up with it. So I'm going to go on to my, my second suggestion. Um, and that is that the system uh, is not working because there are real limits to what most states can do uh, the, to what the public sector. And really to get a big change in the level of effectiveness, which is I, what I think we should be caring about, not so much new laws, not so much new plans, uh, but actually disrupting money laundering, um, confiscating dirty money, putting money launderers in jail and all sort of this thing, is that the state needs help. Um, and that the state needs help really from two constituencies. One, kind of the not-for-profit sector, very ably represented speakers here. Um, for me, it's really significant that most of the big complex money laundering scandals and complex corruption scandals have come to light not through this kind of vast, expensive anti-money laundering apparatus that we've built over the last 30 years, um, but through whistleblowers, um, through investigative journalists, um, through NGOs, uh, and often through people in the legislature more than the executive. Um, Margaret, of course, but people like Senator, Senator Carl Levin in the United States, who retired a few years ago. Uh, and that it's really we need an alliance of people from the not-for-profit sector um, to really empower them, uh, not only to detect most of the complex financial crime, which you wouldn't think is their job, but it tends to be the way things turn out. If you look at big scandals like 1MDB uh, in Malaysia, or the various scandals afflicting uh, banks in Scandinavia, Danske Bank, but not just Danske Bank. And that really we should open up more room uh, for these sort of principal actors by doing things like better protecting whistleblowers, better protecting investigative journalists from things like um, slap lawsuits, uh, that we should give NGOs more power um, to take action through the civil legal system, and I think um, give more power to the legislature as well to supervise on the executive and check out what exactly is going wrong with the law enforcement. Now that might be the kind of the less controversial half of that two-part solution and the, the more part, the more controversial part is it seems to me obvious, but other people again tend to get offended when I say this, that investigating cross-border financial crime calls for a range of very specialized and very expensive legal and accounting skills that are scarce in the public sector, but are abundant in the private sector. So that if we want to really make a dent in this squillion dollars of dirty money that we have circulating through the world's financial system, that we need to somehow harness the power of that expertise that's in the private sector to trace, freeze, and seize that dirty money. And the hint about what motivates the for-profit sector is in the name that we are kidding ourselves if we think that corporate social responsibility is going to do the job. 
the private sector, like aforementioned law firms, but also other ones. And that really what we should be engaged in is for-profit corruption hunting uh, when it comes to transnational accountancy firms and law firms, because if you're really interested in tracing and confiscating dirty money, these are the people who have the skills and who can do it. And if we look at the sorry, sorry record of state law enforcement in Britain and in almost every other country, I think what we have to think about is just tweaking the system, a 5% improvement is not gonna do what we want. We need to have a system that's orders of magnitude more effective than it is. And I'm not sure that fiddling around with the existing system is, in fact, I'm pretty sure fiddling around with the existing system is not going to do that. And so we need to do something big. Lisa, I'm, I'm going to run with you on this one, but uh, how can it be moral for private firms to make a profit from financial crime? I think, first off, I mean, how happy are you with the status quo? Um, my answer is not very happy uh, because money launderers win almost all the time uh, and law enforcement only rarely wins. The United States is a partial exception there. We can maybe argue about that. Oliver's made this good point. Um, but I think certainly in Britain and in most other countries, um, you know, 25 years ago there was a report saying money laundering is an, is an area characterized by criminal successes and law enforcement failures. And for all that's changed in the last 25 years, that hasn't. Um, again, I think that if you need these complex skills, you're gonna have to pay for them. Um, and I just don't see a way around that. I think, you know, first of all, it's unlikely you're gonna get a huge infusion of money into British law enforcement or most countries' law enforcement. And I'm not actually sure, even if you did have that huge infusion of money, that it would actually produce the step change in effectiveness that we want. So I guess to that extent, I'm a pragmatist. Um, I wanna see money launderers hurt. Um, and I think the means for effectively doing that, again, are in the private sector. And I think relative to the situation in both terms of effectiveness and morality, the existing system of practical impunity for kleptocrats, enablers, and other money launderers is much worse than the prospect of having an efficient system operating largely on a for-profit basis. Thank you, Jason. Before I pass on the word to, to Margaret, just one final, more UK-focused question. Other countries, some other countries at any rate, have enforcement, enforcement capacity in this domain that is m more impressive than those of the UK, sometimes much more impressive. Uh, by flagging out this role for the private sector, are you sort of assuming that this gap in state capacity in the UK specifically cannot really be addressed. There, we, we're too far from any ameliorative effort that might allow the UK to fight this out in a more conventional way. I think, in, I mean, I'm conscious that other people have, will probably have more expertise. In fact, probably everyone on the panel has more expertise on me than that. But in terms of it being politically realistic, uh, in principle, uh, yeah, if money was no object, um, if you had you know, some really big legal changes. And if you had a, I hesitate to say political will, because when you mm -hmm. say all we need is political will, that's saying all we need is everything. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, if we did have, you know, occasionally you do see these moments of possibility. Again, February last year, uh, things that were previously impossible became possible in a very short space of time, uh, for better or for worse. Um, so I think, you know, in principle, Yes, but in practice, I just think the chances of transforming British law enforcement to make them orders of magnitude more effective in tackling dirty money, I'd be happy to be wrong, but I just don't see it. Thank you, Jason. Margaret, uh, many of the issues that we're discussing here today plague modern economies uh, as a whole. Uh, it's, 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 it's a global issue, but what are the problem, what problems does the UK specifically have with illicit financial flows from kleptocratic regimes? What's the UK story? Um, I've also got the UK story. Can I, can I have a comment on two? two of course, things? yeah. Uh, one is on Jason's thing. I, I mean, I've sure. talked before about um, we, should, we should use the skills in the private sector to get them coach to turn gamekeeper. But I would rather like to see, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, I'll start again. I, I, I've spoken before about uh, using the skills of the private sector to um, support uh, our endeavor. But I would just make two points. I don't think it's an either or. I think it's a both and. And um, I think you shouldn't underestimate 
the actual that you know people go and work in the public sector people don't work just for money i mean i'm here in oxford are you all working for money you know people do, do have other other um ambitions for their for their for their work and i think working in the public sector is rewarding and it's interesting and that motivates a lot of uh, very bright talented capable people um there just aren't enough of them because it's deeply underfunded so I would say to you, of course, you've got to get enforcement right. And that, that is an absolute, we talk about that all the time, all of us in, the, in, this, in this space. Uh, but I would do both and um, uh, use the private sector, let, let the poacher turn gamekeeper a little bit, but also don't undervalue the, the actual you know, talents that we've got in a lot of our agencies. They're just under-resourced. They really are under-resourced, and we need to do that. And then can I just do a comment on the global bit? Yeah. Because um, I've, I've been working in the sphere now since 2010, when I first sort of lighted on the whole thing of tax, being a complete uh, lay person on these issues. Um, and um, I think if you go, uh, and so I, I work quite closely with the OECD in, the, in that 2010-15 period when we were trying to rewrite the, rule, the, uh, the international rules on tax avoidance. They've been at it since 1980, 19, you know, and got nowhere. And I think this seeing confidence in a new institution run by the UN, I'm afraid, um, uh, smells to me as being a similar sort of, in, you know, we, will, we would not make any progress. So I'm much more of the view that if you really want more progress in this, in, in this space, and we've got the opportunity, really, we should turn the ghastliness of Ukraine into an opportunity on the money laundering uh, landscape. I think you work with the big economists. So if we can get something going between, uh, you know, uh, Europe, uh, America, ourselves, Canada, Australia, those big things. That is the start of building a capability. I illicit wealth will flow elsewhere, but it'll become far, far more difficult for it to find a home. And I think that's I think, uh, um, important. And I would just add one other thing on this. The one thing that we can bring, us as legislators can bring, is voice. And I never really understood the importance of voice in this and learned it in the 2010-15 period when I chaired the Public Accounts Committee when really just getting people to understand tax avoidance, because they all thought it was all so complicated, like we think with money laundering, it's beyond them. And actually all this stuff belongs to all of us. And therefore we've got all the professionals, all the NGOs, all the politicians, all the academics, all the investigative journalists have got to talk about it in a way that, uh, uh, that uh, get, gets people understanding and then anger. And I think, over time, it's a, it's a very sort of Fabian view of this, but over time we've changed the level of the debate, so we changed on tax. When I first started on tax, it was cool to avoid tax. It was seen to be cool to do so. That's changed now, and I think you can use voice as also an important instrument. So that's all my pre-sorry comments on, on what, why, why does it matter in England, in the UK? Well, it is big. I've got I've got guesstimates around, but I mean, if you just think about it, if the guesstimate that you put together, Sue, and the academics in Portsmouth and others put together are 350 billion pounds, okay, it's a guesstimate. It's 15% of GDP, it's double the health budget, it's, uh, it's three times the education budget. It's mega, mega, mega bucks. And if you can get that uh, across, that's one of the reasons why it's really important. And we've become the jurisdiction of choice for dirty money. That means on all those trusted, those indexes of trust that actually help support a healthy, vibrant financial services sector, we are going in the wrong direction. So our, our history of being a trusted jurisdiction could well get undermined by the reputation of being uh, the jurisdiction that all dirty money goes to. So that's the first reason I think that it matters. Um, I, I mean, I always talk about these four arms, and I won't talk too long about them, but we, we We've deregulated like mad under both Labour and the Conservative governments. So we have very poor regulation. We want smart regulation, which is what we're certainly working on at the moment in relation to the Economic Crime Bill. Um, not too, not. I'm not, you know, madly. Let's have, have lots of regulation, but let's have regulation that works. And that's what we're trying to do with company house reform and with introducing the failure to prevent. We need proper enforcement. We've talked about that. We need much better transparency. If you look at the um, uh, 
the new register we have of overseas of properties held by overseas um overseas entities there's still i think transparency international came out with a figure of 52,000 properties we don't know who it is who owns them because of uh, the opaque structures with uh with uh, um uh, with uh, our, 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 all our tax havens and all that and also the fact that trusts aren't covered in any in, in, in any way by um, transparency regulations is also now becomes a new vehicle through which people hide their money and we need proper accountability. I just think about us asking and asking and asking for the report on golden visas and how they were abused and that still hasn't come. And our discovering just by chance how the sanctioned uh, the individuals who are sanctioned then manage to get money out of their own coffers to actually take action against um, um, uh, uh, slap action against um, uh, journalists who are trying to expose their wrongdoing. All this stuff, if there was proper accountability, could come out. Why else does it matter? Why is it important to us? It is because of our relation. Why are we, why is, why has Britain become the, one of the jurisdictions of choice? We've got this big financial services sector. And I think the thing there that really gets my goat, which I've learned over time is, as well, is that um, not only does it matter to the UK economy, but they are incredibly powerful in every corridor of power in government. You know, they're on all the committees. If you look at the Treasury committees and who they consult with, I bet you're not both, you're not on one. No, no. <laughs> just check my facts. <laughs> uh, but um, they, they only consult with, uh, like, with, uh, with those that um, tend to be making money out of illicit wealth or tax avoidance or whatever it is. Um, at, they are just a very powerful lobby. And I think also there is this fear post-Brexit fear, I do think it's linked to Brexit, that you know we've lost so much in the economy through Brexit, that if you start uh, destabilizing the financial services sector, which is one of the few sectors that is functioning uh, and supporting growth, then you would be undermining the economic prosperity of the country. But it's that influence that I worry about. I think our relationship with our tax havens is appalling. And then, uh, and um, we've now got this, I'm not allowed to mention firm that took an action um, uh, in Luxembourg, which put back an agenda that we've been working on for years and years and years of public registers of beneficial ownership by um, saying it contravened privacy, privacy rights in relation to the uh, in, in relation to, uh, European rights, and that is a real step backwards. Um, and, but, but, you know, I mean, I have to say, Andrew Mitchell, who I was here before with, is still committed to trying to ensure that we get transparency in our tax havens, which, be, which will be the first way in which we undermine it. Um, and the only other thing I, I, I think that I, I want to say, to, well, two things is, one, we have let, as Sue says, we've let in really dubious individuals into the UK. It's really, really scary how we've done that, and the golden visas in particular, which is why that report will be so important for us to see publicly. Um, there was a period in 2014 when we let in something like nearly 1,200 individuals under the golden visa scheme. No checks at all. We now that know that 60% of them were either Russian or Chinese. So goodness knows who came in on that. And then the final thing to say is that is now infecting our politics. And I don't make this as a partisan point. I think my colleague who took um, half a million quid from the Chinese is as evil as uh, the conservatives. From Rishi Sunak onwards, they've all taken money from um, Russian uh, kleptocrats. Uh, and they are, far, they are now sort of absolutely involved in um, uh, and influential in all sorts of, at all sorts of levels, at both the party political level and at the government level in advisory roles or in, in supporting um, uh, uh, particular organizations and taking slap actions against some of us on this, uh, on this platform when we dare to expose them. So um, I think Britain is, it does matter to us. I think we've got to act nationally. I would like to see us working with those big economies together, but we are losing our moral compass and I don't feel comfortable with that. I want us to do something about it. Uh, we are, we're losing our, our reputation as a trusted jurisdiction. And finally, we'll never, ever, ever get rich on the back of dirty money. It's an absolute, uh, uh, it, it, it's a myth that that is the way in which to get economic growth and prosperity in the UK. Thank you, Margaret. I was going to ask you about enforcement <laughs> You're very much involved in the, leg in the legislative process, especially with the Economic Crime and Corporate Transparency Bill. 
and we wouldn't think of belittling the importance of the legislative dimension, but in many of your interventions, you've also inf emphasized enforcement and running through the other uh, sets of comments is the fact that the UK seems to have an enforcement gap. Oliver notably has written about this. What would you say once this legislative agenda gets through and one assumes it will get through substantially as you would like it to, let's be optimistic in this, <laughs> in this regard. What are I'm talking to a lot of Tory, Tory peers at the moment. <laughs> What, what, is the, what is the enforcement story there? Uh, let me just say one thing on the legislation. Yeah. The most important, if, if there's one amendment that we're desperate to get through, it's the one that Sue's been working on for God knows how many years, a decade or more, uh, which is a failure to prevent. If we can get in a failure to prevent offence, uh, all the evidence shows, whether it's in the Bribery Act, whether it's uh, in health and safety, that that, at a, you know, it, it will change behaviour. So that is actually a cheap way without enforcement of actually stopping many of the enablers from um, um, colluding with or enabling. Uh, uh, so I think legislation does matter. And that's, that's the bit I always think, what's the most important thing to me? I think that change, getting that right, would be the most important. Enforcement, we are useless. Um, you know, you look at all the agents, you look at America, actually, it is, you know, Biden has in, sees it as a national security threat, so should we, we don't, because of all the fears to the economy that I'd outlined, so they're increasing their budget by 30%, we, we cut ours by 4%, we've got economic crime, Mark II, there's absolutely no money behind it, you need the money behind the enforcement, we put forward propositions from this coalition, which has been a brilliant coalition between the NGO sector, academics and, and parliamentarians. We've put forward some sensible ideas that you could ring fence the fines and recirculate them back into enforcement. Uh, and if you look at the Danske Bank mm -hmm. settlement in America, um, where uh, to avoid crim uh, litigation around criminal offenses, two billion pounds was uh, 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 was raised in, in two billion dollars. Sorry, this was raised in in fines. If we could recirculate that. That would go a long way. Sorry, go a long way to to uh, uh, improving matters. Um, and we could also put a cap on the costs. So when you do get, thank you very much. The, when you do get lawyers who who litigate effectively and expensively on behalf of uh, wicked individuals. Uh, they don't get their costs back from the state because that becomes a huge deterrent to acting to our enforcement. So more money, ring fence it, cap the costs, and then bring in the private sector as a partner, but don't but, but build the capacity in the state sector as well. Thank you, Margaret. Thanks so much. And thanks to the other panelists for excellent starting comments. We now have just under 35 minutes to engage with our audience, both the physical audience here and the online audience. I would just like you to, if you could just raise your hand when you want to ask a question. I see several already. Please do two things. Uh, introduce yourself very briefly and be very, very concise. Don't, don't make sort of comments or statements. Just ask the question because we have quite a few, quite a few uh, people who would like to, to participate in, in the conversation. Uh, I see someone here in the front. Sorry. Uh, do you have your hand in the air? Yeah. Thank you. Um, my name is Yevhenia, and I work at Highgate, CEO Advisory. Um, I was wondering, in light of the upcoming FATF of June plenary in Paris, how would you estimate the chances of FATF of blacklisting Russia, and consequently, how effective would you consider this to be in tackling financing of the war in Ukraine, if not anti-money laundering, and ultimately refining the due diligence process? Oliver, do you want to take that? Um, I mean, I would say the chances are very high. FATF will blacklist Russia. I mean, the, the, the EU already has. I mean, the EU is not normally very brave when it comes to taking these decisions. So I suspect it will have. What impact would it have? I would say none. Um, if any uh, Western uh, financial or law firm is not already uh, disengaged from Russia, then it, it's foolish. I mean, anyone who needs to be told by FATF that they shouldn't be risking the wrath of the Department of Justice is a fool. Um, so, uh, you know, I, yeah, it, it, it's, it would be, I'm sure, of, of symbolic value if FATF took that step, but, um, you know, I don't think it would be much more than that, to be honest with you. Thank you. Duncan Higgs? 
Thank you. Duncan Hayes, Transparency International UK. The, the history of the FATF coincides with a post-Cold War order in which uh, global governance was in vogue for addressing transnational problems. So uh, what do you consider to be a, a, more, a more attractive uh, mechanism in a multipolar world where jurisdictions like the United Arab Emirates, for example, enjoy geopolitical autonomy, never mind the rise of competing systems for, for tackling what is fundamentally a, a transnational problem. Thank you. Perhaps with Jason. Sure. Um, I, mean, I, I think that the natural territory for academics is always to say this isn't working and this is terrible and someone should fix it. And then people say, okay, smart guy, how should we fix it? Um, and academics usually go a bit quiet and change the subject at that point. Um, I mean, I think like Margaret, I'm a bit, I can see the political problems of the FATF. I think the listing process is really politicized and there's double standards. And I think that that's pretty hard to dispute. Um, like Margaret, I'm a bit skeptical of shifting it to the UN um, and ha having this as kind of a, so on the basis of sovereign equality. Um, I really think that, that the current state-based system is as good as we can get at the multilateral level. I think that the FATF rules are not terrible. Um, the problem is they're not enforced. Um, and as, you know, ag again, my spiel is that um, with rare exceptions like the United States and in scary ways, police states, um, that actually more of the enforcement needs to happen at the domestic, but also the kind of transnational level, um, international NGOs, um, but also uh, international corporations. Um, and so I'm just skeptical of, you know, replacing the FATF with a truly kind of global organization there. I just don't see that as being the priority for where reform is. Um, I think it's, again, it's not more rules and different rules that we need. Uh, it's different enforcement. There's a question here. And then the, in the back. Thank you. My name is Sonny Iroche. I'm a 2022-2023 senior academic visitor at the African Studies in Oxford. I'm a Nigerian, a proud one for that matter. Margaret, uh, I would like you to explain to me the difference between the golden visa and the Nigerian minister that you said has over 20 billion US dollars, not in Nigerian banks, but clearly in UK banks or in banks in the Western world. What's the difference between the golden visa and people like that? And she's not the first Nigerian to get exile in uh, asylum here. We had in the 70s, a transport minister uh, who was given asylum here in the UK. So I'm a bit confused between the golden visa and a kleptocrat who come and reside in the UK. And for eight years now, nothing has happened to the 20 billion uh, Nigerian funds here. And Nigeria is really under a 96% debt to GDP. That's Thank you. It. Sunny, just one clarification. I believe it was Suholi who mentioned uh, uh, Alison Madweke rather than uh, Margaret Hodge, but we can, we can address that in a second. Danny Dorling? Uh, yeah, Danny Dorling, uh, Department of Geography here. Uh, thank you ever so much uh, for talking about this. Uh, I'm interested in the geography, but, but not actually in the geography of other countries uh, in Britain because it strikes me we're not very qualified to tell other countries off given where we stand. Uh, Margaret said you don't get rich on dirty money, but we're in the, in the Indian Institute. Uh, that beautiful fireplace behind you is still there. You know, we, we are expert at bringing in money to particular parts of England. Um, what, sorry, short questions. What does it take for countries or places that have got used to getting rich by not having to work hard for the, by themselves. Can you look further back in the past and say, 
when there were equivalences, not the same, rather than saying it all began in the 80, 1980s and 70s, what does it actually take in the past? Because clearly, a country that thinks it's making money from this and doesn't think it can make money from anything else other than gambling and higher education is unlikely to actually do much about it. So what will actually, what has before meant that things have changed? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Clara, perhaps a third question from the online audience, and then we'll sort of come back to the panel. Um, yes, so Les, Les has asked, in a recent book by Andrea Binder about offshore financing and state power, identified legitimate offshore financing being used to allow states to get to finance and to allow companies to siphon off their profits. Does the FATF deal with these issues? Thank you. Who wants to start? Margaret? Um, I mean, I just thought that what does it take to make things change? Because I think, and I wish I knew the answer because we would have done it. <laughs> um, you know, we'd have tried it. Um, so I, I think voice doesn't matter. Sorry to come back on that, but I think you can change um, cultures and things. I mean, you know, uh, Russia, the, the invasion of Ukraine has changed. I've never seen it in, 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 in just among my, my colleagues in Parliament. It's completely changed. I can talk to anybody now about dirty money. I may not agree about anything, you know, Europe, Brexit, abortion, gay marriage, whatever, but you can agree about Russia and you can get them on, on the same page on, on, on Russia. So I think voice and just raising the issue matters, which is why I keep saying it's, we've got to simplify what is an incredibly complex concept uh, to get that anger. We managed it around tax. It was sort of, you know, we did manage it then. I, I sort of hope, keep hoping. Then, if you get that, then you've got to do this, you know, let all these other things, the legislation, the execution, the transparency and the, rig and, uh, the accountability. But that, I, part, if we can't get people, you know, politicians respond if they think people are angry about something. Um, and you, we, so we have to raise our voice. I, it's, it's not a very strong answer, but it's the only one I can think of. Sue? So. I, I absolutely agree. Moral outrage. <laughs> and it is hard until Russia. It's been hard to make it feel to people like it's connected to them you know, in a way that the NHS is or, you know, potholes. It's, it's, it is, it's, it's tricky. And I think that's the difficulty of spreading it out um, beyond Russia, because people understand Russia, but, you know, they don't understand, you know, the rest of kleptocracy or, or, or why it's a problem. Should I just answer the question about uh, golden visas? Um, so I don't think uh, Diazani came in on a golden visa. But I think what's interesting is how she stayed here, and it's how she stayed here is a, also how a, um, a prominent uh, Pakistani uh, former prime minister managed to stay in the UK, escaping his conviction and his prison time in Pakistan was on a health visa. Uh, and I think this shows that actually what you have is some um, bit of double standards, well, quite a lot of double standards in the visa system, um, and, and a complete lack of... Um, real will within the home office and the immigration system to take kind of corruption and kleptocracy seriously and have really resource you know with kind of uh, proper financial investigators um but um so i think that my understanding is that is how diazani has stayed in the uk for so long was on, on health grounds and getting access to uh health uk health possibly you know, the health of some of that 20 billion, um, <laughs> I'm not sure. But I mean, I think you, you know, it's a really good example of how frustrating it is for all of us that enforcement in the UK is so weak because she was arrested in 2016. And then as you say, there's been a kind of complete uh, a blackout. You know, we know nothing about um, what's going on. Am I, am I, are we having general panel discussions? <laughs> no. I was going to move to Oliver, please. Oh, right. If you want to add anything. I just wanted to say about Jason's point and about what we did in Duncan's question. I, I mean, I think it is genuinely difficult. I agree with the UN. I, I think the UN will just lead to um, kind of 
paralysis, you know, uh, uh, and it won't be respected. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there are ways that FATF could be improved as a starter. Like, and if you look at what some of the OECD does, I mean, it might not be perfect, but it is more robust. It means, mm -hmm. you know, involving civil society. Uh, it means having an independent chair. It means having open meetings and a much more transparent um, process. I mean, when the FATF came to the UK, uh, and I think we've mentioned the UK got the highest rating of any country ever, you know, for how marvelously we combat money laundering. Um, they wouldn't meet with anyone from civil society. You know, we even tried to get the agenda about who they were meeting. So when was that? This was um, 20, it was published in 2018, wasn't it? Oh, as recently as that. Yeah. We did a freedom of information request of who they met with. It was, each one was blacked out. There was literally, even just the agenda of who they met with. And the secrecy is absolutely insane. And civil society is only allowed in a room as an affected party, not to kind of talk about the broader money laundering rules. So I think there are steps that could be taken, but what you have to have is someone like the UK or the UAE being able to be punished at an equal level to the Cayman Islands or some of the small island states, because otherwise it's completely not credible. Oliver and then Jason. So quickly, on, on the golden visas point, it's an excellent point. Um, I think one of the most fascinating things about golden visas globally um, is that Chinese applicants are either a plurality, as in the UK, or an absolute majority, as in the US, Canada, Portugal, many other places. Um, golden visas in those countries cost between a million dollars and two million pounds. It is impossible for a Chinese citizen to legally take out more than $50,000 from China. So that money has to have been laundered out of China. Um, I, you know, I'm not saying that it is our business capital controls, but capital controls mean that the money is moved illegally, and yet we are very happily taking it directly into our budgets. It's an extraordinary thing that that's been happening for decades without anyone caring. Um, on Danny Dawling's point about um, imperialism, I live about half a mile away, half an hour away from Powers Castle in Wales, which has the world's greatest collection of Mughal artifacts, um, which were not collected entirely legally. Um, the word loot is a Hindustani word. Um, it is remarkable if you look at some of the houses on Eaton Square, much beloved of Russian oligarchs, how many of them have blue plaques on telling you that they are the previous resident of a viceroy of India. Um, uh, you know, money moves through pipes, and those pipes are established, and the money moves in the same way. Um, however, and, you know, obviously I don't want to make too much of this, um, if you do want to look at a previous success, you know, Britain having been uh, an active, enthusiastic, leading participant in the slave trade, um, became an active, enthusiastic voice in ending the slave trade. Um, you know, that does not in any way wipe out Britain's stain for having done it in the first place, but it was something. Um, you know, as Margaret said, moral outrage was the driver of that, and moral outrage over Ukraine could perhaps help to, to end the movement of illicit wealth. It, it's going to be much harder um, because, you know, it, it is not such, such an easy point to make um, as, a, as, a, as a moral outrage because it's hidden. But still, I do think that we can take a bit of hope, a little bit of hope perhaps from that. Thank you. Jason, the point about Andrea Binder or, or anything else from you? Sure. I, I was just going to say, I think. Um, the choice that the UK and other centres face is actually morally easier, um, that it's not true that we have to have, we, we either have to kick the props out from our economy um, or tolerate dirty money. So to that extent, I think it's not like the East India Company or slavery, that actually dirty money, I think, as, as Margaret and others said, is a relatively small share um, of the, the proportion of the economy. Um, the, the absolute numbers are big, hence this kind of squillion figure, um, but if you look at the overall figure, um, then in fact, I don't think it's a choice between either prosperity or morality there. So for all the kind of doom and gloom about this issue, I think it, to that extent at least, um, it's actually easier than is made out. We can do well and do good, um, I think at the same time, have a financial sector um, that works pretty well. After all, the, the US has vastly more robust enforcement and it doesn't seem to have cramped the style of their, um, their financial sector too. Um, I think, I mean, again, I really endorse Sue's point that um, the FATF, you know, could work better than it, than it does, and particularly this idea of, you know, the complete lack of transparency there. And I think the OECD um, Anti-Corruption Committee, as Sue has said, does actually provide that when the 
UK was uh, so outrageously untolerating corruption through the BAE scandal that Sue did so much work on, uh, the British government was deservedly hauled over the coals and really thoroughly embarrassed in public um, by this OECD committee. The FATF is actually housed in the OECD. Legally, there's no such thing as the FATF. It is the OECD. Um, so in principle, there's no, no reason it couldn't, uh, couldn't do that as well. Uh, on the kind of Andrea Binder point, you know, an excellent new book just published, um, in, published recently. I think, yeah, again, there is this... Um, stigma against the idea, and uh, people have referred to it, particularly Oliver, about let's go beat up on UA or Nauru or some other place in the South Pacific, um, despite the fact that most of the dirty money is in the United States and the UK. Um, I mean, again, a kind of unfashionable view that I hold is that um, actually a lot of offshore finance is legitimate, or at least as legitimate as that that takes place uh, in close proximity to here um, or in New York. I think um, the, the reason that the islands are now probably more virtuous than onshore places is not because tax havens are filled with warm, wonderful human beings who really care about the human race, uh, but because they've been beaten up pretty thoroughly for about 20 to 25 years uh, in a way that major onshore economies have not been beaten up. Um, and so I think, you know, to that extent, it's not just that enforcement is the key domestically, although I think that's where the action is, um, but I think it's also international pressure and international enforcement and the kind of moral outrage that I think uh, Sue and Margaret have rightly talked about is not just something that's deployed within borders, within Britain or any other country, but across borders as well, this kind of naming and shaming. And I think, say what you will about the FATF, it has been very effective in clubbing small countries um, to improve their standards. At the same, you know, the overall morality of that is not wonderful in the sense that they've refrain from clubbing bigger countries in the same way at the same time. Um, but I think at least it does show what could happen and what should happen. Thank you, Jason. Um, another round of questions? In the back, please. Thank you. Um, I'm Peter and I'm a student uh, here. I wanted to ask, because if you, if you think about it from this issue starting in 1980, the, the big obvious elephant in the room to me is that this is enabled by new technology. Previously, if you if you had more money, you'd have to lob, like move a bunch of gold over. So I wanted to ask if there's anything that we could do with the hardware of wealth transfer rather than thinking about it in terms of the software. If you think about rather than institutions that can control what people can do, you think about what's like the fundamental technology by which people transfer money and are there ways you can design that that makes it impossible to transfer money in like an illegitimate way. And I, I don't know if there's anyone who's worked on that or if that's a thing that could be done, but... Thank that you. seems like a... Thank you for that, for that question. There's another question here. Hello, hi. Uh, Rob Duncan, I spend my days um, trying to sell anti-money laundering and KYC solutions. So I hope, to Jason's point, Jason's we don't stop trying you to, out of business. <laughs> to do that. Um, but um, I just wanted to pick up on, on a couple, couple of things to sort of re-emphasize the fact that we haven't seen any change. I mean, Oliver mentioned you know, cars of cash down in sort of Florida and the Bahamas and so on. I mean, only, only a few years ago, you know, Nat, the NatWest Bank were fined for taking bin bags full of 700,000 pounds in a branch in Bradford. So, I mean, nothing's, nothing's changed in that regard. And so I, I sort of, I wonder whether, you know, we are effective in, in, in what we're doing and sp specifically around fines. Um, I mean, Dame Margaret mentioned that Danske Bank were fined $2 billion by the United States. Well, the United States also fined BNP Paribas $9 billion in 2016 for, for stripping out sanctions messages. That was a quarter of their revenues that year. You know, what, 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 what's changed? Um, and my, my question, I suppose, really is, is the problem the fact that the, the money that is um, relieved of these institutions in, in terms of fines really doesn't really belong to anybody. It's not the, it's not the staff's money. It's, not anywhere, it's the bank's money. Who, who really cares? Um, and whilst I know and work quite closely with a lot of the time, a lot of very good and very hard working compliance officers in some of the larger banks, and I would hate to see it happen to them, would it help if the punishments were more personal? Would it help if it was their money that was being taken? Would it help if a few of them, much as I would hate to see it, were sent to jail? So personal liability rather than just, yeah, thank you. There's a question over there in the back, and then another one, this gentleman here. 
Thank you. Just just on that last point um, about personal Can liability. Can you speak up, please? Oh, sorry. Um, just on that last point on personal liability, um, something that's been very effective in large financial services firms is use of a senior manager's framework. And I don't know if you're, the, qu the question I have for you is, the, does the contemplated legislation consider something similar for professional services firms where you apply liability to firms, especially large, say, accounting firms? Um, but I, I, I recognize your earlier points about enablers versus actual and, actors. Sorry, and you are? Sorry, my name is Ryan Lindstrom. Um, I work for the Bank of England. Thank you. And the final question here for this round at any rate. Hi, I'm Richard Seaboom. I belong to a new Quaker group called Quaker Truth and Integrity Group. Um, my question is a different one. Money laundering uh, starts with the kleptocrats, but the kleptocrats must start somewhere. And they always seem to start from, administ from national administrations, sometimes with public support, sometimes by coup and where the administration allows the kleptocrats to pillage their own country. Um, to what extent is, uh, is naming and shaming the only answer to that one? I was reading recently about Iraq and Iran, where this is happening. Thank you, thank you. These are very rich, poor questions. We're going to go into, I believe this will be our last sort of uh, uh, round of questions, but then we'll, you, you're welcome to interact with the speakers afterwards if you want to ask uh, additional questions. So uh, shall we just start with Oliver and go, go that way and end with Jason? Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, Peter, great question. Um, I was at a compliance conference last a week, a couple of weeks ago, and they were showing me this amazing AI stuff, which you could do generating incredible reports in a touch of a button, translate it into Polish, into Welsh, whatever you like. It was really something. Um, uh, and I sat scratching my head thinking, w w it's just nonsense, because um, when you talk about new technology, um, it's old technology that matters. Um, every single year, the US government prints $100 billion worth of $100 bills. Um, it's prob probably, I haven't done the, the maths on this, probably America's most consequential export year after year after year. Um, you never see them, $100 bills, where do they all go? Um, Switzerland produces a 1,000 franc bill. Um, the, the EU no longer produces a 500 euro bill, but it still produces a 200 euro bill. Um, you know, the old ways of laundering money are the best. You can't deploy AI on banknotes. Um, you just move them around in very large boxes. Um, and that's how money laundering tends to happen. Um, you know, I'm not saying that at the margins crypto isn't important, of course it is, but cash is king when it comes to being a criminal. And, you know, essentially that involves, um, you know, so what would be a technological solution to that? No longer printing $100 bills or indeed $50 bills. No, you never use them either. Um, no longer printing 1,000 franc notes or 200 or 100 euro notes. That would be good. Um, I, and while I'm dreaming, I'd like a pony. Um, uh, um, but to Rob's point, I, I, <laughs> what I was, but to Rob's point, I, I, I did a talk at a school uh, a couple of years ago, and one of the kids, sort of quite a large 18-year-old, who'd been sitting slouching and looking at me, put his hand up at the end and said, if you know all this about money laundering, why don't you just go and do it? Um, and uh, um, it's a really good question, which I've sort of wondered about ever since. And I, to be honest, I think if I were a, 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 a solicitor or, or an accountant, it's a question that might occur to me quite regularly, since the downside is, is so very minimal. You have essentially a 0% chance of being caught. And if you are caught, an almost 0% chance of anything particularly bad happening to you. I agree. I think a few, um, a few uh, targeted prosecutions, jail sentences for professional enablers, so that you were the kind of person, oh, that wasn't that the guy who, oh dear, um, that would be useful. Um, you know, I think that would be, that would be absolutely great. Um, you know, in terms of the question of, of what, what's changed, I don't know if anyone, any of you saw The Gold, the Brinks Matt um, drama. There was a rather good uh, documentary that went with it. Um, I can't remember what it's called, but it's on the iPlayer. Um, actually, I thought rather better than the drama, in fact. Um, I thought it was hilarious that this local branch of a bank near Bristol was taking it was giving out incredible quantities of banknotes to a gold retailer um, two weeks after the biggest gold heist in history um, and did not feel the need to report it to the authorities because there was no requirement for them to do so. That is no longer possible. Uh, the situation has changed. There are now significantly more um, um, folder roll around money laundering. It is more complicated, but the volume of cash is not being, the volume as a proportion of the economy has clearly not changed. Um, it, entrepreneurial money launderers are finding ways around it and it requires a far more entrepreneurial response 
uh, if we're going to do anything about it. And, you know, I think what Jason's saying about unleashing the private sector is potentially really exciting. Imagine an army of bounty hunters going out there, pursuing all of these flaws in, in you know, it'd be great. Anyway, um, that's me. I just think you're cheap. I think you're settling out for a pony. But um, I, I, can I just, one thing on, on the regulation of, uh, of AI and technology, we can't, you can see how difficult it is in what's happening in the online harms bill. It's never going to, trying to regulate those platforms and those, uh, the people who control the, the, the uh, new technology is a nightmare. It's a complete, absolute nightmare. And you run against uh, uh, arguments around uh, you know, freedom, uh, freedom of speech and protection of individuals and all that sort of stuff. So I just think it's a nightmare. I don't really, un I don't understand crypto properly. I keep trying to, but I don't really understand it yet. Uh, I'll put my brain around it, but I think it's just, if we, if we could think of, of a way of regulating AI or all these things, that, you know, it would be really important. Um, and the, I'll come back, this issue about uh, trying to uh, not get individuals and companies to be accountable for their actions, hold them to public account through a criminal offence is the key thing that Sue and I and others are working on. Uh, and if we manage, if we just manage to get that through in a sensible fashion uh, over the next few weeks onto the legislative book, that will be, a, I think it'll be a game changer because it's, the kleptocrats don't dream up these uh, mechanisms that they employ on their own, they're dreamt up by the enablers, by the people we call the enablers. Um, and I'm afraid the banks are at the heart of it, uh, as you see in, in the FinCEN files or any of this stuff. So they may spend zillions, you're right, on, on anti-money laundering, but it's just stopping me opening a new bank account rather than, uh, rather than getting any of the uh, guys through. They just make too much money out of it. I remember a hearing we had with HSBC where their Swiss branch was being used for not just tax avoidance, but clearly tax evasion. And there was the Falciani leaks. It was the Falciani leaks, the uh, dossier that had been leaked by um, a, mem a member of staff. And the head of the audit, who went on to become a conservative minister, just said to the committee she, two things. She, all she said, he stole them. He stole them. And all she was interested in was getting at the whistleblower and punishing the whistleblower, and that was their only reaction. And she should have seen as a red flag that this little branch of this uh, of the Swiss bank, of the HSBC, the, it was HSB Swiss branch, was making um, completely ridiculous profits, and anybody carrying out their audit function should have seen it, so they're in the middle of it. Sorry, that's a bit of a diversion. So if we can get through that individuals and their companies can be held liable for their failure to prevent uh, money laundering and fraud, that will be the most important legislative advan advance we achieve. And we're not entirely pessimistic on that, although um, uh, we are still away from doing that. And actually, the current minister always puts forward the best argument to it, although he seems to have forgotten what he believed in a few weeks before he became a minister, um, uh, which is, health and safety, and I think it is a great example, because if you think in the 70s, uh, there were a lot of accidents on building, um, building sites, and people died and were injured, and we reformed health and safety in the mid-70s to create individual liability on companies and their um, uh, directors for the health and safety of their, of their workforce in, on the sites, and overnight, he claims, this is the minister, that over 90% of, uh, of uh, incidents, of um, uh, accidents on sites ceased. So it's not that we want to lock all these people up, it's actually that we want to change their behavior and threatening them they'll, with a criminal offense, I think is the best strategy for doing that. Thank you. Um, yes, on the tech, give law enforcement AI, I say, and let them get on with using it against the criminals. <laughs> um, on the senior executive accountability, well, the account, individual accountability is such an important question. And as Margaret says, there's a kind of, uh, the, probably the amendment that's least likely to get through is actually on that. I mean, if you look at the NatWest, it's extraordinary. You know, if you look at every single money laundering fine the FCA has done in the last five years, in the text it says, you know, senior manager, so-and-so new, uh, you know, but 
there's been no action. There's been no prosecutions. Uh, in fact, we've been doing a bit of review of who they are prosecuting. It's generally people from the unregulated sector, small enterprises. You know, it's really, really problematic. And I think it's not an either or. We need the big fines on companies. We need them bigger, in fact, because they lodge in companies' memories that this hurts. Uh, and we need that money that comes in not to go to the Treasury, but back into law enforcement. But we desperately need, um, you know, some kind of individual accountability. And, and to the point about the senior managers regime, you know, the trouble is we're going in the opposite direction. As you'll know, there's a consultation at the moment about actually weakening uh, the senior managers regime. And, and the question at the heart of that consultation um, by the Treasury, I think, encapsulates what we've been talking about, which is, has this regime been putting people off coming to work in the UK in the financial services? You know, I, surely the question is, has it been actually attracting better candidates to come and work in the UK in the financial services? So absolutely, let's roll it out to the whole of the regulated profession, but we're going to have to try and save it first, I think. Thank you. Jason, last word. Um, I think in terms of what's changed there, I mean, there have been kind of progress in cognate areas. I think if you're a small-time international tax evader, uh, life is a lot harder for you now than it was 20 years ago. Um, tax evasion is not the same thing as money laundering, but it's not a million miles away either. So if you've got between two and ten million dollars, or t two and ten million pounds, and you're looking to evade tax, that's quite a lot harder than it was in the late 1990s. Um, I think if you've got less than that, uh, old school things work particularly well. Um, if you're a small-time drug dealer, cash works perfectly fine. Why try harder? Um, I think for the technology, I'm like Oliver. I'm a bit of a skeptic in terms of that. I don't think cryptocurrency is terribly important for most financial crime. Um, but I think that, you know, at the at the upper level, then in terms of the big fines, um, I think they're good. But it's also it orients banks to care about regulators, but not really care about money launderers too much. Um, so I like the big fines. I certainly agree in the UK they should be bigger, particularly if the money can be recycled in a useful way to get more enforcement. But I think one of the sad situations now is that banks do pay a lot of money for software and hire hundreds and hundreds of people in their compliance departments. Um, and both banks and regulators in their unguarded moments know that most of this industry is not actually doing much good because the point of the compliance industry is not to catch money launderers or to stop money laundering. It's to stop $8.9 billion fines from the US Department of Justice or whichever regulator it is. Um, and neither the private sector nor the regulators can really say that out loud. Um, but there is this kind of anti-money laundering theater that goes on. Um, which I think is really unfortunate, both in letting money launderers get away with it, but also inconveniencing all of us uh, and doing more than inconvenience to people in the developing world as well. Thank you, Jason. And I, I know it's customary as, as the chair of such events to say how wonderful this was, but this was really wonderful. And you're really a, a great, great, <laughs> great panel. Uh, let me end by thanking I'd like to thank my colleagues Tom Main and John Heathershow for uh, invaluable advice in putting this event together. Uh, also thank the Joffe Trust for its support and thank most of all Charles Godfrey for your constant support of our program. And on, on that note, um, please join me in thanking uh, the panelists.